Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending Marine Science Day. My name is Vanessa Strom, and I will be your host for this session. In this session, Dr. Mike Unger, a professor at VIMS, and his graduate student, Kristen Prosner, will be discussing their innovative approach to studying marine pollutants. After a short presentation, we will have a Q&A session in which Mike and Kristen will answer your questions on this topic. Now, I will turn it over to Mike to get us started. Thank you very much, Vanessa, and thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon and giving myself and Kristen a chance to talk to you about um, some of the research that we're doing to develop new ways to understand the, the, the fate and effects of pollution in Chesapeake Bay and elsewhere. I'm an environmental chemist by trade, and it's become a very interdisciplinary science. Um, we need to understand how the oceans transport water and sediments. We need to understand how chemical contaminants um, can affect organisms, the interrelationship of organisms, how these chemicals may react and cause reactions in the environment, and how they may partition the environment. But most importantly, we must understand how to measure the chemicals to understanding their movements and effects. Um, Analytical chemistry um, to measure pollution, VIMS is really good at it. Our, our lab has been doing this for many years, um, but it's often the, the, the limiting step in environmental studies due to time and cost. Um, we always want answers quickly, so we want methods that are fast. We want them to be low cost so we can run lots of samples. And of course, we want high quality data so the information is valid. And there's an old saying that you can pick any two of these. It's, it's very hard to get all three. Um, one of the problems that we have is analytical methods for organics are slow and expensive. These are actually the steps that we use in my lab to look at low concentrations of environmental chemicals um, in Chesapeake Bay. Um, environmental samples are very complex. They have thousands of compounds. So there's these multiple steps to isolate and concentrate the molecules that we're most interested in. So it takes days and weeks to understand the concentration and get a single data point. If you've watched TV shows like NCIS, you may see them run a sample and instantly get data. That's not reality. The reality is it takes a long time, it's expensive. So what if we had a method that was remote, rapid, and easy and reliable to get us that fast, cheap, high quality data? And believe it or not, mice are helping us to do our chemistry now. And we can take environmental samples, and if we can develop a black box that uses monoclonal antibodies from mice coupled to electronic detection, we theoretically can get fast data that's quantitative and it's reliable. And this technology advancement is not unlike what's happened to the mail system. If you think about it, years ago, if you wanted information and wanted to share it with somebody on the coast or across the ocean, you wrote a letter, put it in the mail, and it would take days or weeks to get there. We've technologies evolved and now we can send somebody a text and get an answer in minutes. Can we do that with our chemistry? So the solution that we've been working on is something we call the biosensor. The bio portion of this are monoclonal antibodies against contaminants that we develop with the help of mice. And these antibodies then bind the contaminants. And we can look at that binding in a special instrument called um, an inline sensor. And we've been working on developing that with our colleagues at Sapodyne Instruments out in Boise, Idaho. So what is an antibody? An antibody is a large Y-shaped protein. It's produced um, in, the ser in your sera um, by plasma cells. And the antibody binds antigens on a specific region of the antibody. And over time, if you're exposed to antigens, um, your body will develop antibodies that has a high specificity to that particular antigen. This has been in the news a lot lately um, because of the COVID uh, pandemic. And there's been a lot of talk about the development of antibodies and being immunized to develop antibodies that will recognize the, the COVID virus. So what happens is over time, you develop these antibodies and they will bind to a certain portion of the virus. You may have heard in the news about a spike protein on the COVID virus. So you're gonna develop antibodies over time that will bind to that spike protein. On a bacterial cell, it may bind to a portion of that bacterial cell. And if you're exposed to the bacteria, the virus, those antibodies in your body will bind and um, produce an inactive virus that cannot replicate anymore. So where do the mice come in? The mice come in in that very similar to you getting that flu vaccine or a COVID vaccine. Um, with a flu vaccine, you're injected with a dead flu virus or an active flu virus. Over time, you start developing these antibodies and you have a nice um, quantity of antibodies circulating in your body. If you're exposed to that flu virus, 
they bind and the virus isn't able to replicate. Um, in the case of the COVID vaccine, you're actually injected with mRNA um, where you produce the antigen within your body. And over time you develop antibodies that would recognize the COVID virus. Um, and es especially that spike protein in the COVID virus um, and then ultimately inactivate it. In our case, we're interested in antibodies developed in mice that will bind pollutants of interest. In our case, what we're doing is we're taking the pollutant molecule, covalently binding it onto a protein to make it immunogenic, injecting the mouse, and then over time, the mouse develops antibodies that will bind to the free protein, or excuse me, the free pollutant in a sample. Um, and then we can take the cells that are producing these antibodies and fuse them to, provo to produce a hybrid cell line um, with a myeloma cancer cell line that we can produce in the lab and have an infinite, um, an infinite supply of antibodies produced in cell culture. So we're doing this to actually provide a reagent to use our, in our instrumentation to bind contaminants in the environment or in the instrument. So how are we exploiting this new technology? So we literally have the technology now to look at samples quickly. We can analyze a sample in about eight minutes. We can use small volumes of environmental um, aqueous samples and run them, and we can get low concentrations of reliable data. Um, this is an example right down here of the kinds of concentrations that we can measure in a few minutes with the biosensor, and it correlates beautifully with what would take us weeks with our conventional analytical chemistry. So we have something that's fast, relatively inexpensive, and reliable. And what I'd like to do now is just show you some of the ways we're applying this technology to do environmental analysis to understand uh, pollutant fate, transport, and toxicity in the environment. One of the places we're using this extensively is to understand the environmental fate and effects of oil. Um, oil, if, if you see uh, results from an oil spill, you often see this nasty mess on the surface of, of the ocean or the estuary that occurs during a spill. But oil is made up of thousands of organic compounds. And one class of these compounds that we're particularly interested and concerned about is a class called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons or PAHs. These aromatic hydrocarbons are the most water soluble components in a soil spill and they dissolve into the water column and they can produce toxic effects to aquatic organisms. Um, so that's a real concern and we've developed antibodies um, in mice that will bind these and we can use this in the biosensor. One of the ways we're using this is to detect how these compounds that we can't see during an oil spill might propagate during an oil spill as it, as it moves in the environment. This is some collaborative work that we've done with um, colleagues at ExxonMobil. And in this case, we did a simulated oil spill um, at a giant tank up at New Jersey. So we obviously we don't want to put an oil spill in Chesapeake Bay or the ocean. So we contained this oil spill. Um, they produced the spill. I was taking samples over time as it moved down this wave tank. Kristen ran the samples on the biosensor in the lab. And the same day as this was occurring in the wave tank, we produced this blue line right here and traced the increase in the PAH concentrations as, as the oil spill moved down the tank. Our colleagues at ExxonMobil took samples, sent these away to their lab. It took weeks to get this data, but as you can see, um, almost in near real time, we could trace the propagation of these compounds that you can't see that are acutely toxic to organisms, but it would take weeks otherwise to run. So what happens if this oil spill contaminates our seafood? You, I'm sure have seen the results of, of, the, of the large oil spill that happened in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and if this oil contaminates our seafood and we use conventional technology, it can take a long time to get results. So what if we can use this technology to look at seafood? So with this, I'm gonna turn it over to Kristen so she can talk about some of her research that she's focusing on for her PhD to see if we can adapt this to seafood. Hi everyone. Um, so after an oil spill occurs, with the current state of the science, there are really two main methods available to do so. So first we have uh, essentially sniff testing where people are highly trained to actually sniff out contamination in seafood. And uh, this may be a fast method, but it's not necessarily quantitative and it's questionably accurate. And then the other method that's available 
is um, a traditional lab analysis of the seafood tissue, which is a quantitative method, but it's incredibly slow and expensive to run samples. So um, <clears throat> what I'm interested in looking at for my research is, um, can we have both? Can we have a fast and quantitative method and use the biosensor to do so? So um, basically my method is <clears throat> um, to take a sample of oyster blood, mix that sample with uh, our antibody, and then we're able to run this mixture on our biosensor. And in just about seven minutes, uh, we can determine the concentration of toxic hydrocarbons that are in the oyster based on how much antibody binds in the sample. And the biosensor seems to be really good at measuring the concentration in oysters. Um, and so we've actually used the biosensor in two oyster-specific applications so far. So first, uh, we use the biosensor to actually map um, contamination hotspots in the Elizabeth River down in um, the Portsmouth, Chesapeake, Norfolk area. Um, and this was in collaboration with the Elizabeth River Project, um, <clears throat> which is a local nonprofit down there. And then we also, um, simulated an oil spill in the lab with oysters and then use the biosensor to track um, the oysters ability to take the constant take the contaminant up into their tissues and then also um, track their how they uh, depurated or removed the contaminants from their system after we transferred the oysters to a clean tank with uncontaminated water thank you Kristen um one of the other applications that we're finding very useful for the biosensor technology is many of the contaminants that we study are what we call hydrophobic in nature. They tend to accumulate in sediments. And one of the challenges in environmental chemistry is to understand how these chemicals that are in the sediments can be transferred to, to organisms that live in the sediments or in the water column. And does that cause effects or cause accumulation in the food chain? And so one of the things that we've actually discovered is the biosensor technology is very good at predicting what's available to organism and what's the toxic fraction in sediment. So we can take the interstitial or poor water of that sediment, run it in a few minutes on our biosensor, and it does a good job of predicting the toxicity to benthic organisms like amphipods that live in the sediment. If we look at our conventional method that takes weeks, it doesn't do nearly as good of a job as predicting the toxic fraction because it tends to extract everything that's in the sediment, not just the portion that's toxic and available to the organisms. So this is more um, technology that we're collaborating with colleagues from oil companies, consulting firms, and other colleagues at, at universities to exploit this, this, this new method and to better answer the effects and um, transport of chemicals in the environment. So where is this going in the future? Some of the new and future work that we're looking at is what kind of antibodies can we develop that would be useful for fast, um, um, inexpensive ways to analyze contaminants. You may have heard in the news something about a group of compounds called PFAS or the forever chemicals, the polyfluorinated alkyl substances. It's a family of chemicals. There's over 7,000 different compounds that have been identified. And these have been used in nonstick Teflon cookware water repellent clothing, clothing and stain resistant fabrics like Scotchgard. And in particular, they've been used a lot in firefighting foams to help put out fires um, that are related to, to oil use and things like aircraft fires and things like that. So what recent research has shown is that there's been a lot of interest because it looks like there's potential hormonal effects um, and other adverse environmental effects. And, the, and research is starting to show that these compounds of contaminated groundwater um, in areas all around the country, in particular in areas where they've been produced or where Department of Defense bases where they've practiced firefighting. So it's merging as a major health concern. They're very difficult to analyze. Um, and um, we're now working to see if we can't develop mouse antibodies in a really rapid method to, to help understand the scope of this problem and help solve it in the future. So with that, um, we, we've given you a quick overview of the, of the new technology we're developing and, and how we're using it to understand pollution, fate, and transport. And I'd like to thank all our collaborators over time and our research team and, and kind of open it up for, 
for questions. All right, thank you so much. Thank, thank you to both of you for that great presentation. So I will start out with a question for Kristen. Um, why did you pick oysters for your organism to measure PAH? Um, that's a great question. So oysters, <clears throat> since they are um, sessile organisms, meaning that they stay in one place for most of their life, it's that means that they don't have the ability to swim away from the contamination. So they're really just kind of stuck in that environment, which is great for us to measure the concentration of the contaminant of the contaminant, but it's also maybe not so great for them. Um, and they also don't have the ability to actually metabolize this contaminant that we're interested in. Um, <clears throat> so that really just kind of builds up in their tissues over time. And um, unless they're transferred to a clean water system, then they're really not gonna remove it from their tissues. Okay. Um, Georgia wants to know, how does the biosensor work? Um, okay, so the biosensor, if, if we want to get into the depths of it. Um, so the biosensor works by mixing the environmental sample with the antibody, and then it's passed over a detector where, um, where we have a competing antigen, something that's very similar to the contaminant that we want to measure in our sample that binds what portion of the antibody um, isn't associated with the pollution that's in the sample itself. And on that antibody, we've put a fluorescent tag. And that fluorescent tag is excited with a certain wavelength and we can measure the absorption of the light from that fluorescent tag. And so the, the amount of antibody that isn't used in binding the contaminant gives us a response in the detector. And we can calibrate that with a series of standards and get very quantitative data from the environmental samples that way. Right, okay. Um, Tracy says, this is amazing. And she also wants to know, how did you realize that antibodies could be used in this way? Um, that's a great question. Um, this actually started um, some time ago where I, I collaborated with um, a colleague of mine that, that passed away some years ago, Steve Katari. And we started talking, he did antibody research um, and looked at developing an mouse antibodies. And we started talking about it and realized that there was the potential for developing this technology to look at the pollution that I was interested in studying. So we started collaborating. But as far as using antibodies to detect chemicals, it's been used for a long time. It's, 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 a, it's called an immunoassay. And something you might be more familiar with um, is like a pregnancy test. And a pregnancy test actually uses antibodies to um, tag a specific hormone that's in the urine of pregnant women, and that's how you get that yes-no answer. Well, what's kind of interesting about how we've advanced the technology is with the instrumentation, it's just not a yes-no answer, it's quantitative. So we're, we're, we're learning how to identify how much of the contaminants in the environment. And that's what's exciting that we can do it and do it so rapidly. Right, right. Um, so what is the error that's associated with the measurement or percentage difference between the results that take a while, that take weeks to be analyzed um, compared to your method? Um, it, it depends on the kind of sample. Um, so, so one of the things the antibody does for us is it gives a measure of the total um, um, pH concentration, those polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that we're interested in, whereas the GCMS methods that takes weeks gives us a measure of the individual compounds that are in the sample. Then we have to total it to get a comparative answer. Um, one of the interesting things that we found out was that um, there's often more reported with the biosensor than our GCMS. We went back and looked and the GCMS method wasn't picking up some of the compounds that the biosensor did. Um, so the GCMS method, you have a hit list of compounds that you're measuring and looking for, then you add them up. The biosensor is, is actually measuring everything that's in the sample that's related to that class of compounds. So we think that's why it's so good at predicting what's the toxic level, because all of those compounds contribute to the toxicity to the organism. Okay. I think we should mention that there's also hundreds of different um, compounds in this class of contaminant yep. that we're interested in. So this is a question for you, Kristen. Um, what did you mean by oyster blood? 
<laughs> so, <laughs> um, so oysters don't actually have blood like uh, we do. Um, it's actually something called uh, hemolymph, and it's um, the t it's essentially the blood of an invertebrate like an oyster. So. Um, it's what will carry the contaminants that were interested to the different tissues. Um, yeah. Okay. And when you measure PAH in the oysters, are they still safe to eat? Um, that's a great question. So um, really an important uh, component to deciding whether or not something's safe to eat is the dose. So um, it really depends on the amount you're eating and where you're where they're being taken from so there's a lot that goes into what what actually is considered safe okay and are you thinking of testing these antibody anti antibody reactions in other species um yeah so we actually have also looked at using the biosensor to measure pahs in mussels and it also seems to be a good method for mus for mussels as well um, and when did you notice or first notice the need for this faster technology to be able to analyze your samples? I think um, it was really started to become noticeable, the limitations in the current methods available after this Gulf spill that Mike mentioned earlier. Um, there was um, a significant portion of the Gulf was closed for fishing and harvesting after the spill um, <clears throat> and it remained closed for a really long time. And um, I think a big component of that length of time was this time lag of the data and not really being sure how um, contaminated these sites were that people wanted to fish in. And, and I'll add to that, what the, having this technology is redefining how we ask questions in environmental chemistry. Um, you know, typically if it takes weeks and it's very expensive, we, it's, hard, it's difficult with the traditional methods to get much data. And so, because of the fact that we can get samples really rapidly and run more samples, we can ask questions about temporal changes and spatial changes that we couldn't do before. Um, like looking at the water that's the interstitial water in sediments, for instance, we only need a few mils. We can look at runoff from a rainfall event. Um, we're, we're asking questions that we wouldn't even consider doing with the previous technology that we can do now with the biosensor technology. Right, right. And Jonathan wants to know, I think kind of a clarification. So the long lead uh, studies that take a while to analyze the data is giving a gross estimate, whereas the biosensor is more accurate and providing more specific results? No, it, 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 and to clarify that, no, it gives different, different information. If you need compound specific information, the longer term GCMS analysis is required. So we're just getting a sum of all those compounds. But what we're finding is it may be a better representation of the toxic fraction. So it really depends on the question you're asking. If you need compound specific data, we still use the long-term method in my lab. If we need um, more gross data on where the whole class of compounds is and the total and how that's affecting organisms, the biosensor might be a better way to go. So it really depends on the question you're asking. And, and what kind of analysis is best. Well, it looks like our time is just about up. Um, so thank you, Mike and Kristen, um, for being here and helping us learn more about your research. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.